And we have it as you were. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. I am Suzanne Petri with Straterez, um, Lighting Manager for our team here. Um, and we are back for session number four of our Sherpa Snack and R series with the Great Blue Park. Um, so we're going to be going over um, lighting slips today. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier to Bruce, I think this is where we're starting to see a lot of our other sessions start to culminate into, you know, you know, feet on the street and getting everybody moving. Um, so Bruce, I'm going to hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here with you yet again. Um, I feel like we've, we've definitely crossed a threshold um, as we're now on the downward slope of this uh, snack at our mountain that we've been climbing, uh, session four on lighting slips. We're going to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so as we talk about lighting slips, it's really watch your step. What is it that we are um, looking to as it relates to what is a slip? Uh, a slip is a, is a, uh, a slide or an unintentional. Okay, let me back up. A slip is sliding unintentionally for a short distance, typically losing one's balance or footing. That's why we have the banana peel there. Every one of us has, has had those, those situations where we felt off kilter, a little out of balance as we've stepped on a surface and kind of lost our balance. But another really interesting definition for slip that I think really applies to what we're talking about today is, is a pass or change to a lower or worse or different condition, typically in a gradual or imperceptible way. And, and I would say that uh, the lighting industry, as it relates to overall construction and contractor grade products and the built environment, um, there's been a, a noticeable slip in the overall quality um, as everything else within a home has, has increased in quality, um, even the, 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 the home itself. But the lighting, for whatever reason, has maintained a steady state. And we're going to talk about um, how that manifests as we move forward that might give you a little bit of leverage when you're engaged in conversation about uh, lighting in a home. But we have to start with, you don't know what you don't know. And I think it's important to recognize that um, how we understand and how we learn. And a wise man once said, to know what you know and what you do not know, that is true knowledge. So what, what do you know? Um, I've, I've heard this diagram before that there's three spheres, right? I know that I know. So everything inside the blue dot are the things that I know that I know that I know. So for example, I know that my name is Bruce Clark. I know I live in Illinois. Um, I know how to ride a bicycle, right? I know those things and I, and, I, and I have a knowledge of that knowing, right? But there's a lot of other things that I know that I don't know. Like, for example, I don't even know the name of Suzanne's children. I know that she has them, but I don't know their names. And I'm aware that I don't know those. And, and when you apply that to um, the, the building industry or the lighting industry, um, there's a lot that you know that you don't know. I, I know that Lutron carries controls. I know that Ketra has these 16.7 million colors that they can, can tune to, but I don't know how any of it even works at, at the deeper level. So there's, there's that sense, but there's even a bigger sense beyond our boundary of knowledge of the things that we are aware of that we know. This, I don't even know that I don't know these things. And I think that's where people sometimes find themselves. Um, and, and at the outer reach, at, reaches of that is the outer darkness of ignorance where there's just no knowledge of anything at all. And, and those, are, those are real conditions that we all experience every day. And as that scope of knowledge grows, the more that we know, the more that we know that we don't know. And then of course, the more that you know, the more that you don't know, and it just keeps going on and on as that, as that sphere increases in size. So how does that relate to what we're talking about today? We're, we're talking about status quos. Um, it, you just go round and round and round and round and round and round. And that's a status quo. It, it's, it's a maintenance of an existing state um, for the purpose of continuity. And you know, you got tradition and you have, you know, like I, I, I just am comfortable in this, in this condition. And, and that's kind of where things are at. And I think that's a lot of where the building industry is in many ways as it relates to lighting. Um, but there's another interesting aspect um, here as we, as we kind of step into it. What is the status quo? You have a person that says, I want to I build a home. They have an, an image in their mind. They say home. So they throw some money at an architect and he designs a set of plans for them. They send those out to bid. Then a contractor is paid to start the work on this home and voila. They've built the home. But now how do you deal with the lighting? 
uh, we're going to go ahead and put it in here. And then we bring in this electrician, gives him some money. And he's like, well, how about you want to light here? Well, how about you want to light there? How do you want to light there? And they do that typically through a walkthrough when the project has gone way down the line and the person um, who's going to occupy the home is thinking, uh, I guess that seems okay. Um, let's just go ahead and put marks on the walls. This guy seems to know what's going on. And then once they've, they've signed off on that, then they pay him some more and he goes ahead and wires it and lights up and boom, everyone's happy. We're done. You know, there you go. Done deal. That's the status quo. Uh, for a lot of projects, uh, almost everything that's um, up from like a shack all the way up to like multi-million dollar homes follows a very similar paradigm to that. But getting emotional, what is it about a status quo that allows it to be so entrenched? There's this emotional aspect to the status quo called a status quo bias that when we perceive any change to the status quo, we are naturally predisposed to seeing that as a loss. Um, we want to maintain that continuity. We don't want to step into the new territory. And it's at an emotional level. And as a result, it's beyond a typical rational kind of experience. I, I don't rationalize and say, well, the, the status quo is better for these logical reasons. There's just more of a gut feeling that I have about that. So when I weigh out the risks and the rewards, and if I'm talking with individuals, if I don't involve the emotional component of this process, I'm going to miss really connecting with the individual. If I just simply lay out the, the points of saying, this is why it's good for X, Y, and Z reasons, and this is how much it's going to cost you, boom, it just makes sense. You might not get that sale unless you kind of uh, approach them maybe from the position of a deeper emotional state. So as you want to get them to strap in to go along for the ride, how do you do so? Well, I think one of the ways that we can connect to individuals on an emotional level is through experience. And one of the ways that we can create experience is by how we simply present ourselves. If I present myself to an individual in a way that they really feel like, man, I can trust this person. Um, they seem very convinced. Um, there's, there's a lot of persuasion in how they carry themselves when they're talking about this. That can go a long way to create a positive experience that makes feel, pe people feel comfortable. But even more than that, what if you yourself step into the experience yourself? Um, and that could be where, you know, we talked about this briefly before, if you want to create an experience center. So showroom design is kind of a big thing for some people where in order to really understand light, you have to experience light. Um, in order to really understand what it could be, you have to see and experience what currently is and then transition into a space where they, they can see and understand at a deeper level what the difference is. And in many cases, it's a very stark difference. Um, and then the other one is, is simply maybe they have friends or other individuals who have also stepped into that space and they're like, hey, I like what Joe's doing over there. He seems to be having a good experience. The water is fine for him. So why don't I just go ahead and jump in? And that's uh, things that can help people to kind of take that step out of a status quo mindset and maybe more into a place of trust. So when we talk about trust, we're talking about these things called trust. We have trust issues. So what are the, the areas of trust? So in a, in a building um, project, we have these trust building exercises. The first person that we bring in possibly would be the architect. Um, and the architect is someone that we trust. We want them to go ahead and work on the house. But what is the mindset that the architect brings to the project? The architect is looking at how all the materials fit together. They're looking at the site. They're looking at the position. They, they understand the elements, maybe the prevailing winds, maybe the sun angles. Maybe they also understand where the, the rooms need to go for a sense of flow and order. And they, they, they have a master plan of how the house or the home is going to go together for the greatest effect that uh, achieves their overall aesthetic and the way that they want to practice their, their craft. So they're a part of this. Um, then you have the interior designer. What is the interior designer thinking about? What's in their mind as they are approaching this project? Well, the interior designer is interested in the personality of the home, uh, the life of the home, all of the, the elements that really give it its own individuality and make it something special. <clears throat> so they're interested in finishes and they're interested in materials. They're interested in furnishings and, and some of the other uh, accoutrements that you may have, like your washer and dryer and your other appliances and things like that. They may pick, pick those things out for their finishes, towel bars, artwork on the walls, all that kind of stuff. And, and so there's, there's that aspect that they bring to the home, which is vital 
to um, that, that, the success of that project. Then of course you have the builder. What is their job? They are thinking about execution. You've given me a plan architect. You've given me some of your input in your plan, also interior designer. So we're gonna implement and we're gonna execute that. So I'm looking at schedules. I'm looking at uh, the, the, the various trades that we're bringing together for the project to make sure that that's all coordinated well so that whatever I've bid on the project is, is gonna be met or I'm gonna fall below that so that I can you know, make, make a profit as a builder. Um, and so there's those aspects that they're looking at from a, a time and materials and schedule and scope process, right? Then one of the sub trades that the builder's working with is electrician. What's the electrician primarily concerned about? I think the electrician primarily concerned about is that the house isn't gonna burn down because of faulty wiring or any kind of overload to a circuit. A lot of times that's a major place of their own safeguard of why they're involved so that you're not gonna plug in something that's gonna to draw too much power um, and you're gonna have enough outlets wherever you need them. Um, and they're gonna make sure that all the wires are up to code and that um, all of the appliances and lights that require electricity, everything that requires electricity is gonna have power where it needs it to whatever extent that it needs it. That's their primary point of focus. Then you have the trusted custom integrator. What is the thing that they're thinking about the most? Well, as homes of a certain caliber come online and they have a lot of sophisticated technology, they're wanting to understand what are the different protocol languages involved in making sure that this device and this device and this device have a level of compatibility. Uh, we're going to go ahead and install uh, security systems or you know theaters and those kind of things. And they want to make sure that all of those pieces integrate together at a technological level to really bring a level of sophistication to that home to make it perform at a higher level than most homes do. That's why they call them smart homes. And the custom integrators are vital to allow that to happen. So these are individuals that are involved in this process. So the question is, who do you trust with the lighting then? Do you trust the architect, the interior designer, the builder, the electrician, the custom integrator? What do you do? Who should be the one that's going to help the, the owner understand where the light should go and why it should go there? And I've done some of my own scientific research, and I found um, with, with a very robust survey that I conducted with myself and just a couple other people, <laughs> That, that I'm estimating that probably if an architect's on the job, 33% uh, are going to say, you know, we're going to trust what the architect does at, as it relates to lighting. And they're going to be the ones that are going to tell me where my lighting should go in this project. Um, a close second would be the interior designer. If an interior designer is present, um, clearly they're going to be the ones picking out a lot of the pretty fixtures. And if they can do that and they understand lighting from that standpoint, why not go ahead and let them help lay out the rest of the plan, especially since they know where all the stuff is going to go inside the house. And, you know, Builder is kind of in there as well. Maybe if he's given the opportunity, he's going to lay it out in a very specific kind of way. Um, there, there's, there's a term I think all of us know from big, uh, big box stores is that you have uh, your, your, your lights. And then you have your contractor pack of lights. It's your literally a six pack of lights. It's the cheapest, fastest, easiest to install lights. And there's a reason why that's called the contractor pack or certain fixtures are called contractor grade because most of the time they're designed to be very cheap and they're designed to go in very quickly because what the builder is interested in, his schedule and his scope. And, and similarly, the electrician is also gonna be looking to source products that are quick and easy to put in. I just had some conversations with folks just the other day that in this $2 million home uh, with an incredible level of re renovation that's being done, uh, when I talked with the electrician, what he was actually looking to put into the home were disc lights and wafer lights. They're not even interested in cans anymore. They just wanna stick in something that you can just pop, literally pop into the ceiling and you're done and then they move on. But they're trusted because, hey, they're the ones that are going to be bringing in all the electrical and make sure that everything is going to be wired correctly. And then maybe the custom integrator get, it has trust 5% of the time. I don't know. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less. Um, I tend to think probably 5% is, is an overreach and that most times a custom integrator is like, you know what, you just go ahead and take care of the theater room, make sure that I controls work and we're happy, but, but let, the, let the other people take care of, of the lighting like we talked about in our very first session about all the two by tens. So with these folks that, that have potential to influence lighting decisions in the home, every one of them has, there's blind trust that's given to them, but they also have blind spots themselves. 
And most often the blind spots are the areas where you have a lot of strength. So the strength of an architect is geometry, complexity, and the bid set, right? They're responsible for putting those things out there. And so that's, that's a primary focus. So if you look at a plan that an architect has designed, more than likely, you're going to see everything very symmetrical, very geometrically arranged in the space, which is good for general illumination. But there's a lot of um, opportunities missed in the process, um, and which we'll talk about a little bit further. So let's kind of move them out of the way. An intro designer, they're interested in the finishes and the decoration, the aesthetics. When they think about lighting, they're thinking about light as decoration, as the jewelry of the home. And so uh, their primary focus is gonna be to select fixtures based upon how they look in pictures. And I think we spoke about this earlier. Most of the time, the pictures of the lights are taken when the light is not turned on. And most often it's during the daytime when those pictures are taken. And if there is anything else that they need, they will actually flood that fixture with light just so you can see the fixture better, but they're never interested in actually how it performs or how it functions. And so there's a blind spot to that where they're interested in the aesthetics, but they have no understanding of the performance of fixtures within the home. Uh, we talked about this briefly. Um, he's interested in con just construction, trades, budget. He just wants to get the job done. He wants to make sure that all these different elements of the trade work together. He has a very a pragmatic and practical utilitarian approach to light and lighting. And so he, because of that, he's gonna miss some of the other nuances of what light can actually do in a home. So those are some of his blind spots. Um, the electrician, similarly, execution, simplicity, code. There are some lights that are out there that are just simply too complicated for, for electricians to understand. Um, you know, even the fact that there may be a light that has both a housing that you put in before you do the rough in, then you install the engine, then you do all the finish work, then you put in the trim, then you put in optics, then you kind of mount it together. And for them, it's just boom, one can, one trim, drop in the light bulb, simple. And, and sometimes there's a lot more complexity in that where they just are scratching their heads. And then of course, with the add on the controls, that's way beyond them. And most of them are not interested in learning about that newer technology, which is why I think a lot of that then falls into the lap of the um, uh, custom integrator, right? So you focus on what? Technology, integration, control. And, and within that framework, there can be a certain mindset that you have that's focused only on technology um, and, and the integration control side of things. But then, you know, that could be a bit of a weakness. But as you add more understanding that as lighting becomes more sophisticated, it requires a more sophisticated understanding of controls. And so they really work hand in hand with one another. You just need to add more to your, the understanding of lighting. And I think it really does benefit um, the, the, the custom integrator in this, in this context because they can now include lighting that they say, we are only going to specify lighting that we know works within this integrated control environment. And otherwise you're kind of like left, you know, where you just throw your hands up in the air, like, I don't know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work. So those are, those are some things that are, that are aspects in that context, but the custom integrator is going to have to look closely at the cracks in the lighting wall. And there are, there's a wall that's been erected by the, the, the status quo, but there are cracks in that wall. And if you know what to look for, you can easily spot those cracks. I call this the lighting elephant in the room. Um, and, and I, I, understand it similarly to if I'm going to have a balanced meal, right? I've got my fruits, I've got my vegetables, I've got my grains, I've got my dairy, I've got my sweets. I need a certain proportion of all of those. If I don't know um, what I'm supposed to have, then maybe I'll think that I'm getting a balanced nutrition when all I'm eating is Cheetos and, and Coca-Cola. Or like, for example, when I tell my kids to set the table, they'll just throw a plate on the table or a, maybe a napkin and say the table's set. And I'm like, well, I know that you're supposed to have a glass, you're supposed to have a fork, a knife, a spoon, a placemat, you're supposed to have your salt and pepper out there, because I know those things are supposed to be on the table. When those things aren't there, I recognize, hey, wait a second, this is not a completely set table. This is not a balanced meal. You're missing some things here, 
or maybe you're putting the wrong things out. Like for example, if we're having steak, you don't just put mayonnaise on the table. You want to put steak sauce on the table. Um, so knowing those kinds of things as it relates to the lighting environment, I think is really helpful. And so we're going to talk about a few of these cracks. And uh, this, is, this is all part of your vocabulary. I'm going to call this crack talk. So when you show up on a job site, if they are willing to share the lighting plan with you or the reflected ceiling plan with you, you can start to notice, man, there are, there are some seven deadly sins of lighting that, that I want to draw your attention to. Um, that when you look at a plan, maybe you'll start to recognize it in a more with a greater frequency to recognize that, hey, there's a lot more potential here that you're leaving a lot more on the table. Um, and, and friend, my friend, you know, I, I'm your lighting priest, you can come confess your your lighting sins to me, and I will absolve you by taking over the responsibilities of, of your lighting design. What's the first one? I call it flutter bombing. What is it you put light and you put air with a big old ceiling fan in the middle of the room, that's going to provide all the light to that space that you need. But what happens when you turn it on? Oh, you get like this reflected ceiling flutter. And then the person goes into uh, this uh, epileptic seizure and they pass out on the floor because they, they're just overwhelmed by, by the fluttering of light in the room. That's terrible. I've never, I actually had one time where the, 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 the flutter was so bad, it felt as though I was in a disco, that there was an intense strobe light effect because of the reflection on the ceiling and the way the blades of the fan were with the light. It was just horrible. So flutter bombing, I will almost never, unless I am forced to on bended knee, put a ceiling fan with a light in the middle of a room. I just won't do it. It's just not good lighting. Uh, another one um, is, is everyone's favorite, four cans and a fan, right? You got a room, let's just bring air, put it in the middle, but we don't wanna have that flutter effect. So let's just expand the light out to the sides and just in a nice, orderly, geometric fashion, we'll do four cans in a fan. Oh, the room's bigger? Oh, that's no problem. We'll just go ahead and make six cans in a fan, and you, and you have the problem solved. But what that, what that eliminates is just simply understanding the basic function of that room. It's a very impersonal approach to lighting, and it doesn't take a, a person into account of how they're going to occupy the space, what's actually going to go on. It's just broad light similar to what you would see on a, a gas station canopy oh but but don't worry we're not going to put a fan in the middle we're going to do something extra special we're going to put four cans in a shan we have a beautiful chandelier in the middle this time to really add sparkle and attention to the space similar kind of kind of experience where again it's a very simplistic approach to lighting that misses some of the potential of what lighting could actually do within a space Another one that you might find is what I call divide and be conquered. Uh, what is that? Let's say I'm in a kitchen. I've got an apple in the island and I've got a uh, counter space on the other side. I don't know. Should I light the island or should I light the counter space? Or, you know, how do I, how do I get light there? I got a great idea. Let's divide the aisle between the two, put a light right over that middle in the aisle so that when I reach over to the counter to grab myself a knife, I cast shadow over the knife. And then when I come back over to work on the, on the island, I cast shadow over the, the apple and, oh, I think I just cut my finger off. But don't worry, you can find your finger easily because it's right in the middle of the floor under the well-illuminated pathway between the countertop and the island. But don't worry about any of the other bits and pieces about how you're casting shadow in the areas where you actually need light the most. That's a very typical thing that you'll see on the lighting plan where they just split the difference between two surfaces rather than giving each its own due attention. Uh, something else that you might find is within, um, within bathrooms. Why put, put uh, just put a single light over the bathroom um, sink so that when you get ready in the morning, you have this light that's coming down from above. So like, if I tip my face down, you can see that my brows are casting a shadow over my eyes and then if I have a light on my, under my nose, that's casting a shadow on my mouth. My chin is casting a shadow on my neck. So when I wanna to try to shave, I'm shaving into shadow, maybe cut my neck possibly. And then I just kind of look old and, and tired because I've got all of the shadows on all the creases of my face coming down from above. Our faces are divided with, with a line longitudinally down the middle of our face. And so we need to take into account the full breadth of our face from left to right, not from top to bottom. Vanity unfair, not good. Next, this is everyone's favorite. 
domino no is what I call this. You just have beautiful strict geometry. I got a square room, I got a rectangular room. Let me subdivide it in half and then subdivide that in half and I'll put a light at every single one so you have constant, clear, even illumination. This just kind of takes that whole four cans and a fan to the next level. We call this in the industry Swiss cheese uh, ceilings. And it's, it's just doesn't address the fact that most often you'll have dark corners in these rooms or if you have any art on the wall, as you approach the art, guess what's going to happen? You're going to cast a shadow on the art in that room. There's no sense of hierarchy in the space. You just walk in, it's just all this even illumination, and you don't really know what to look for, where to go, or, or how to respond to the space. It's kind of impersonal and bland and blah, and that's not good design. That's, that's a no. I'm going to just give you a hard pass on that. I'm sorry. Number six, that's what I call shadow land. This is similar to the other ones. Let's say you're in a, in a, in a closet right? And you, you know, want to illuminate the closet. I know, let's just put a one big light in the middle of the room and it'll just, you know, cast enough light everywhere. But what happens when you want, when you wake up in the morning, you want to find your blue socks. It's like, honey, are these blue socks or these black socks? I can't tell because I'm casting a shadow over the socks in my drawer and I, I can't distinguish. And so like having the light behind me is not good. I'm in shadow land. But what about on the other side when I'm approaching my clothes? Oh, nothing in here looks any good because again, shadows are being cast over your clothes and, and stuff just doesn't look as good. You can't necessarily differentiate and discern what you wanna see. And so bringing light into those spaces is gonna be important. A simple light in the middle of a walk-in closet is not gonna do it. I'm just gonna say, that's, a, that's also a hard pass, I'm sorry. And then our final one, top gun down. What is this? This is what most lighting layouts look like. Um, hey, we need light in this space, this beautiful living room. We've got artwork on the walls. We want to make Polly feel welcome. So let's just put lights on the ceiling and we'll just bring light in. You will have plenty of light. It's covering everything. It's all from the top down. And with what we talked about last week, we know that the, the, light, the light of our eyes that responds to the invisible uh, wavelengths of light in the in the certain blue spectrum, right, are the IPRGCs that establish our circadian rhythms. And if I'm only ever getting light from above, that's going to be affecting those, especially even late at night. And so Polly just wants some blue blocker sunglasses because the light is too harsh for their eyes. There's also with our eyes, we have different levels of vision. We have our, our focus field of vision, our near field of vision, and our wide field of vision. And most often, we're only getting light from above in our wild field of vision. And that actually has a negative effect on our, on our overall experience of the space and, and well -be physical well-being and physiology. Um, but because we're just so used to it, because we've been in this status quo experience, um, light from above is just the go-to all the time. Uh, and we're not really understanding it and being concerned about bringing light in from um, different levels in our eyes. So it's going to head us in different ways and that can help um, support a more healthy experience of that space through light. So Top Gun Down is also a hard pass. I'm sorry, but wait, there's even more. These are just design ideas. What about a light that doesn't dim down as far as it needs to? The light itself is subpar uh, because of, of how it was chosen. And, and so then dimming is going to be an important consideration. Or, oh, wait a minute. What if we have a light that is incompatible with the dimmer situation? And so you have a flicker. Or um, there's something called binning when it comes to LED chips, which basically wants to make sure that every single chip that's in this bin um, has a very consistent quality of color. So if you walk into a house and all of a sudden you see two lights where there's, there's two different colors, of light where one's a little whiter, one's a little bit more yellow and orange, that just looks really odd and, and creates a dissonant space. Those are some things at a, a practical fundamental level. And there's a whole bunch more things where you're just simply not even asking fundamental questions about how the person is experiencing and understanding the space that you simply um, never really bothered to, to look about because you only ever think about lighting through a functional utilitarian approach or just mere decoration. Um, so there's got to be a better way, Polly. I agree with you. Absolutely. We will get to that. But in order to get there, we have to have the conversation. So have a seat. How are we going to fundamentally address the lighting elephant that's in the room? Uh, you walk in as a custom engineer, you're like, oh, the, there's a big lighting elephant in the room. How do we address this lighting elephant? Well, there's 
at least four different approaches that I'm going to share with you today um, that you that you might find that can work for you. The first is the direct approach. There's a big elephant there, and he stinks really bad. And you just call it out. Just say, this lighting plan lacks, and this lighting plan needs to be made better. And uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Boom. Very direct. Um, and that might be good if you want to kind of like jumpstart somebody to say, hey, pay attention. This is this is worth paying attention to. Um, you know, that might work for you. And so the direct approach can sometimes be a way that you can do it. There may also be the indirect approach where you say, hey, does anyone smell anything? Uh, it kind of smells like an elephant, you know, um, that might be where like, hey, you know what? Yes, you have light on the plan. Good. It's, it's really good for general illumination. But there may be some other things that we could do to help enhance um, that experience of light in the space if we can you know maybe have a little bit more in-depth interview with the client um, if we understand the direction that the sunlight's going to be coming into the space if we ask them what are the finishes in this room are there any areas of focus and importance that you want to draw people's attention to you know some of those kind of indirect questions where you're starting to recognize the potential of what could be done um, but you're you know kind of coming alongside to assist and support and, and kind of help them along that that path uh, another one that's similar to the direct is the horrific approach. That elephant will kill you a slow and painful death because uh, you're looking at light and saying, oh, you know, Mr. Customer, uh, did you realize that your lighting is actually making you obese? It's actually giving you insomnia. Your hypertension is related to bad lighting. And there's, there's even certain places where lighting of a certain quality is, is given the label of being a carcinogen. It's actually contributing to your cancer, Mr. Customer. Uh, you don't wanna have that in this home. Let us help you with that. That's kind of really shocking them with fear, right? Um, that's the horrific approach. But then maybe there's something that's better. I would say it's the hopeful approach where you're simply saying, hey, did you know that there's a sanctuary where Jumbo can be happy and free? We can create these beautiful scenes that wake you up in the morning gently and it, and it guides you through your day. And then as, at the, as the day ends, you can prepare yourself for sleep and, and all of that can happen behind the scenes through your lighting. And when you have a party, you can adjust it. And if you need to rezone your space, you can do all those things. Let's, let's paint a picture for you of all the beautiful things that light can do for you in terms of its technological uh, sophistication as well as all of the health benefits that come with it. So we're just, we're just saying the current lighting plan that you have is, is not doing that. So let's create a vision for you of what could be done and give you, give you uh, that, that kind of hope at a deeper emotional level that may draw them out of the status quo and into a place of wanting to say, hey, you know what? Let's take that step forward into a, a better lighting experience. So we need to talk. That's, that's my prezzo. Uh, Suzanne and Jeff. Um, and I'm open for any kind of questions that people have, or if there's anything that's been sparked with you um, that you think it would be helpful to talk over in front of those that are tuned in today. Well, uh, thank you. That was awesome. And of course, I'm looking at all of those sins and I see them all over my house, yeah, all over my house. Wow. Yeah. It, it's like you have to choke back the guilt, you know, when you, when you look and you see it and you're like, oh, because once you see it, you can't unsee it. That's the mm -hmm. problem. It's a curse. Yep. So how do you think that that we got to this point of having the, the, the four cans and a fan and, you know, the domino? Who decided that this was the right way to go about an approved lighting? Um, I'm, I'm no expert on, on like the history of, of how we ended up here from a design perspective, but um, I think in many ways, um, the realm, first of all, lighting designers themselves only emerged in the late 50s, early 60s. And most of that was just in the commercial side of things, right? And so they had more sophisticated language in the area of light and lighting um, for the broader public sphere. Uh, but, but lighting, as it was introduced to homes, was always seen as a utilitarian commodity within the home. And it was treated as such, you know, you stick a can in, you put in a bowl, boom, you got light. Um, and over, over time, um, there have been other advances within the home experience. You know, you're looking at your appliances, you're looking at the, the kinds of windows, the insulation, all the elements that make the home a better experience for people. 
but light just continues to fall behind in that context. Only people that are in the higher echelons of the, the housing stock can even begin to think about affording a lighting designer or bringing design into the conversation for light in their home. Most of those people only entertain a residential project at $15,000 just for the design fee, mm -hmm. let alone the selection of fixtures. And so it's always been seen kind of out of reach, but as everything is coming up, as far as its technological sophistication, we're now aware more of what light is and what light can do. And it's being made more affordable so that people can actually stretch just a little bit and still get really good quality light in their home if it's tastefully done. Um, so I think because we've had a utilitarian commodity, um, energy efficiency driven approach, um, lighting has just been about energy efficiency and just getting efficacy, brightness for energy input, that's it. Uh, but now that we're moving into a, a place of really experience, uh, I think those things are, are in, in kind of conflictory uh, whirlpool, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy that we are finally at the point of combating that. <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to take it over. Yes. Yeah, we've got the tools for sure. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, you know, please pop them into the chat. Um, so Bruce will be in person um, in just a couple of weeks at our uh, Stratera's Dealer Development Expo. Ta -da! Um, so save the dates have been sent out. And, you know, honestly, any minute now, a registration link is going to be um, sent out. So um, Bruce has a myriad of topics that he's going to be doing live um, at the session, um, as well as a full list of Lutron sessions as well, and um, a session of uh, Bruce and our very own um, Becca Ryan with Lutron together as they both review a project, Bruce's take um, and, and Becca's take as well. So we're really excited about that. Um, but like I said, any questions, please pop them into the chat. Um, but Bruce, thank you. This is awesome. We're excited for the next session, which is? Um, lighting steps. So uh, today we, we focused on the cracks that are in the wall. And next week, we're going to talk about what are some of the steps that can be taken uh, to just simply bring a level of improvement to the overall design conversation um, with the understanding of, of all that you have at your discretion and, and disposal from lighting products and, and controls technology.